Today, we're going to meet artist Leo Fuchs. Uh, he's listed on the online catalog of uh, professional artists, OCPA. Let me show you the OCPA website first. The online catalog of uh, professional artists is uh, an online catalog of the artists who we selected carefully through our official invitation. And uh, we only select artists who we see professionalism for their commitment, creativity, and craftsmanship. And uh, you see all the artist members featured on the OCPA. And you can search artists by their last name. Here's the Leo's profile page, one of our featured artists. He's in California. And uh, his uh, specialty categories, portrait, then uh, symbolism, and abstract painting. And here's Leo's artist statement. And his bio and classes that he offer. Then here's the artist website. Hi, Leo. So why don't you introduce yourself first? Hi, my name is Leo Fuchs. I'm an artist and I'm a painter. And I chose painting primarily because it links me to the ancient tradition of painting. We have some 35,000 years of painting. And I wanted to be part of the continuum of that tradition, mm -hmm. even though other uh, forms of image making are widely available today, I felt that uh, linking myself to that tradition would also endear me to understanding the means and ideas through which other artists have created their works and what they've contributed to the overall cultural value of them. I see. And uh, would you like to uh, talk about uh, the particular genres you are being interested in? Well, uh, the genre I'm interested in is, uh, of course, was to create a new way of painting for the 21st century. I started painting full time like in 1977 after I retired from advertising. I sold my agency and uh, had for the first time enough money to fulfill my desire to be a painter. And uh, so I immediately concluded that, you know, to paint what people are doing in 1977 is pointless because they're already in line ahead of me. I didn't want to follow the crowd. I felt the thing that was going to be important was to create an art that would speak for the 21st century. And I understood that that century would be characterized by technologies, and new changes and developments in society and a new consciousness was emerging uh, for the uh, collective uh, humanity around the world really. So I wanted to uh, create paintings that would address that. And uh, so for that reason, I decided that I don't want to paint about myself. My art is not about my emotions or my feelings. Uh, and uh, so, I didn't want it to be personal in that sense. And I also didn't want to make art that has already been made because the people who made the art uh, did it very well. I didn't think they needed my help with it. So I tried to create an art that was based on ideas. So the way I 
approached my work was to develop a concept. And the concepts I was interested in were what I call eternal truths, ideas, stories, metaphors, mythologies that preceded uh, us, but have been around for thousands and thousands of years. And that those metaphors, those truths, represented aspects of nature and human existence that uh, underlies our every experience in life. So that, that was the idea I uh, worked toward. I see. Wow, that's pretty deep. Uh, and uh, so to uh, bring that, uh, you know, that like you, like you said, like 30,000 or more years. Yeah. How, how you do that? I mean, how you get reconnected to the past? Right. Do you do like a lot of research yourself? Oh, yes, or? I did a tremendous amount of research and I still do. I mean, I'm actively engaged in studying every day. I read or study mm -hmm. something uh, and it keeps expanding it. And it makes me realize that one person can only know a little. And right. if you're lucky enough to know a little, then you should be happy to know that. But uh, some of the uh, ideas that I research is, I, you know, I graduated from art school with a uh, bachelor's degree in design because uh, I had to get a job when I graduated. And uh, I worked as a designer for many years. And like I said, ended up with my own advertising agency, which I later was able to sell. But... Uh, so when I decided to paint full time, you know, I was sitting in my studio thinking, well, I know how to make pictures. I know how to paint and draw and all that, but what, what meaning will my work have? And as I did reading and research, both in art history and in other areas, I discovered that there was a dimension to art in the history of art that contains spirituality. Mm -hmm. And the spiritual dimension is the idea that really clicked for me. It's like, of course, my work has to have meaning and content, and it has to be related to something that is integral to human life. And so as I look through art history, then I noticed that people in the Renaissance, like Michelangelo, and Leonardo, and Raphael, and uh, Brumante and all the people there, they had access to some information. And one of the books that old man Medici had smuggled into Florence was the Corpus Hermeticum, which was a book about the ancient Greek religion of Hermes. Hmm. And uh, what was interesting about the book was that on one page, they had images of the ancient Hermetic uh, mythology, but on the facing page, they had images of the Christian images and the those artists they saw oh yeah this was taken from here there was a carryover mm -hmm. so there and uh, so what i realized is that these guys even in the renaissance had information and knowledge that went deeper than just the surface understanding of what's going on in the temporal world and of course i went back to the caves of lascaux and fontigam and altamira and and all those paintings had mythological themes. That was the belief system of those people. And then studying the Hopi Indians and other Native American groups, all the art throughout the world in mm -hmm. primal cultures was of a mythological nature. It was their belief system. It was their spirituality, so to speak. So I realized that in today's world where we have no myth makers, we have no shamans, we have very little spirituality. We have religions, but I separate that from spirituality. I, I felt that the job of understanding that aspect of our lives falls to the artist. And that's what I've tried to address. I see. Wow. Uh, that's very unique, actually. I think a lot of artists, uh, are, you know, they're... The, I mean, some of them are influenced by, you know, uh, the artists in the past, but usually they go back to like impressionistic uh, yeah. age or, uh, you know, romantic period or Baroque and stuff. But you are 
going way, way beyond this time frame. And it sounds like you are actually searching for spiritual, spiritual, uh, you know, uh, yeah, sure. realm. And uh, that's, uh, that's great. I mean, you, you know, the way you're approaching artists is so unique and it's, but it's also very challenging, I guess, because when you put out your artwork, the other people who see your work may not feel the way you you try to convey yeah. your message over well, the that's art. Absolutely true. Yes, and uh, of course, that's I anticipated that before I even started this. You know, uh, but I just felt as a personal quest, as a personal commitment to making my art, uh, I would you know attempt to uh, be have as much integrity in the work and dig as deeply as I could. Because also, you know, not just Renaissance artists and primal artists, but also like uh, Mondrian belonged to the Theosophical Society. Uh, Kandinsky in 1910 wrote a book called Regarding the Spiritual in Art. Uh, and Madame Blavatsky with her uh, Theosophical Society was very influential on many artists a woman named Hilma of Klint in, uh, in Sweden in 1895 in her studio was teaching meditation and abstract painting. Wow. So, and then at the Bauhaus school, there were a number of artists who were teaching metaphysical uh, ideas in art. So there is a strong tradition that's been carried on through. I and see. Sometimes overshadowed by other uh, contemporary movements in art, but it's always kind of been there. So yeah. those were great resources for me to look to, to understand what their thinking was and their ideas were. So where are you located, by the way? Are you uh, in uh, somewhere in the desert? Yes, uh, we're in uh, Palm Desert, which is uh, right by Palm Springs. Oh, uh, It's an area I used to visit a great deal. And then uh, as I retired, uh, I decided it was a great place to live because I like the warm air. So I'll click through some of the images and I'll talk about what the idea of aesthetic arrest means. Okay. So here are a couple sketches. You see, uh, I sketch out an idea, but I have the concept first. And the concept here was uh, one of movement. And of course, the circle is an ancient symbol. It's been around for at least 10,000 years that we have uh, discovered so far among different cultures. And then, uh, you know, so it, the work is always a balance between the concept, the conceptual uh, idea, and how to make it work visually as art, you see, because you can have a great concept, but to me, you still have to make it work as art. And the way I worked it out was that, well, I have all this movement, but I didn't just want to like let it flutter off the canvas. So I used the edges of the frame of the canvas and uh, started to uh, turn the uh, serpentine uh, forms into more geometric ends. So that was just, that's just a technical visual uh, thing. But the idea was that energy emanates from this source. And this, uh, I, this painting was called Tiamat. Tiamat was uh, the, uh, according to the ancient Sumerian tradition, the, the mother who uh, was uh, then slain by her sons who took over the earth. But that's just a mythology. Mm -hmm. And here's another one. Here's the idea again. And again, I'm dealing here with two forms of energy. The natural, explosive, uh, uninhibited, expression of energy and movement. And then here in the bottom half, it uh, is moving into a structure which reorganizes the flow of that energy into a structural format. And here, this is just a rough sketch, uh, but that was for a, a painting called Ascension. And the idea here was to create uh, a feeling of ascension but in an abstract format. And this one uh, is called a video, which uh, is an expression of, but these are just sketches, okay? This is what, what I do in my sketchbook, okay? And, but then here we go to the painting. 
And uh, this is called antiverse. And again here, this is six foot by six foot. And we see uh, energy moving from a structured environment uh, becoming unstructured as it moves into an energy vortex. Wow, and, this uh, is amazing. I mean, it looks so three-dimensional and uh, uh, I almost feel like well, I'm going to be sucked into that black hole oh, in, in the well, center. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, I work with, uh, because everything, uh, one of the thing that's, things that's common in all the ancient stories is the duality of existence. Everything has a dual nature, yin and yang, if you will. Uh, this idea has been around a long time. It's and it's still with us because it's part of nature. It's part of the universe. So uh, many of the paintings uh, express that aspect. And here too, I, I'm talking about energy. You can see uh, at the this is called infusium. And at the bottom here, we see uh, we see a very structured organization of forms. But then energy begins to move through those forms. And as energy moves through those forms, those forms begin to re-align uh, themselves to accommodate the increased energy flow until finally it turns into pure energy at the top. So, wow. The colors on this piece is uh, so clean. What medium are you using? I'm using acrylic. Uh, all the abstract paintings I do have been done in acrylic. Wow. They're, the colors are so pure and uh, it's just uh, it's just amazing. It's like, uh, it's like a print, you know, like a computer graphics or something. Yeah, but those yeah, are just uh, uh, the, the actually you're using a brush Acrylic, yeah, all, uh, brush all of my works strokes. are hand done. Everything is hand painted. This wow, one. amazing! And then, uh, oh, and then this painting. This is called Solar Plexus. And again, here I'm dealing with, uh, you know, the organized structure, a field of structure from which energy and life emanates. And then as it emanates and moves forward, it becomes more radiant, it becomes more energetic, and it begins to manifest in other possibilities. And so in this painting, I have uh, something that's kind of symbolizes like the sun and the moon. And then, uh, so I, I try to hide little symbolic elements here and there, you know, and then of course, here we have the uh, complete, free form breaking away of paint from any structured environment. And then uh, here we have like something that alludes to the Phoenix. How did you render all these nice fine lines? What well, kind of tools did you use? A, a, a brush uh, down here where the lines are really fine, they're barely visible. I used some uh, masking tape uh -huh. to create the lines. Uh, but then up here, this part is freehand painting. Wow, you, you're amazing. I mean, the, the, the brushy strokes are so fine and detailed. And then this painting, uh, again, here I'm dealing with energies. And I'm dealing with the idea of that you can see the blue energies are freely moving past this blue line here. Nothing holds them back. You see, they move through it freely, but the red uh, structures are being held back. But then here they break through. And when they break through, they break through with an enormous energy and push out. So th this, this painting then, uh, you know, talks about uh, metaphorically about balance. Everything in the universe has to be balanced. You know, as the Buddhists say, you know, mutual arising. Whenever a force of one kind or another arises, automatically a counter force will arise as well. So that's kind of what this one is about. And, uh, and this one is called duality dance because as I was speaking earlier, everything in the universe is duality. And uh, so here uh, I'm talking about how Duality is two forces in balance, kind of united together because you can't have one without the other. 
they're interrelated. And so uh, I call this duality dance because they're in a kind of movement, a kind of entanglement of, of a unified balance. And then let's see here. Yeah, this one, uh, Singularity, I was uh, actually here more smitten with the idea of color than anything else, but it was the idea that from a single source, something could emerge and manifest itself as a powerful element, uh, both you know metaphorically and visually. And this one is called recombinant differentiation. So what we have here is the emergence of tiny dots, tiny blips of something, but as they expand, they become more complex. They combine with each other, making more complex structures. And this continues then not only to become more complex in terms of structure, but also begins to manifest in various colors and then what those elements which are linear shapes then eventually become more solid shapes along the edges. So it's the idea that something comes from nothing, but uh, those simple singular elements can then combine and recombine to form more uh, complex. You know, the, the centerpiece looks to me like uh, a nice guy with uh, all these stars on. Yeah, yeah, it could be interpreted that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. And then let's see. Oh, this one is called Noetic Perturbation. And here again, I'm uh, working with the idea that from a single impulse uh, that strikes or emerges from the field the field of totality, the unmanifest field of totality, when an impulse emerges, it can manifest into more expanded and complex structure. And I call this noetic perturbation because I tried to relate the idea also to the mind, noetic meaning mind. So that even in the mind, a single note, a single impulse can generate uh, imagination and manifest itself in a grander, more varied scale. And let's see, oh, this one, yeah, this one is called Avidya. And I showed you the sketch for it earlier. So this is the final piece. And here I was uh, speaking more directly at the idea that the entire universe, you know, the world, the life, the universe, everything, is just like filled with excitement and color and possibilities and endless uh, things to consider. But that for most, for avidya means, uh, it's a Hindu term that means total ignorance. So avidya here refers to how sometimes the human consciousness can be locked into a box and they get no color or light just a kind of a shade of gray because they're, they've closed off their consciousness and uh, don't even uh, experience the total possibilities of what they could be. Wow, the background is so beautiful. Oh, it's so you. colorful and uh, you did some drapes and stuff. Yeah, I did. I used a whole variety of, because I was attempting to express different possibilities so that, well, you know, the way to express that is to use yeah. a variety of uh, ways of making marks. Yeah, It even reminds me of uh, Jackson Pollock, you know, paintings yeah. where yeah. he drapes paints and right. stuff. Yeah, Jackson Pollock is one of my, uh, you know, people that I I really uh, look to. He, yeah. He, he was a great painter. He didn't just drip. But this is a lot more uh, colorful and, yeah, uh, this one is you more know, colorful uh, freer and more in a way. Right. Yeah. 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 And this one is called Transmation. And so here I'm showing again duality, one of my favorite themes. And you know, you have the light on the left, 
and you have the dark on the right. And what I have here is a circle with a triangle. These are ancient symbols that represent, you know, much of life and mythology. And, but the idea here is that when you pull them apart, what is revealed in the center is all this color and action and active movement and vibration. And the idea here is that we don't live as humans on one side or the other, that the, imp the pulse of life is in the middle between duality. So the idea here is that your consciousness should rise between the opposites to the high point of uh, enlightenment, so to speak. Mm -hmm. This is 12 foot long, by the way. Wow. It's cryptic, yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the end of the slideshow. And... Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about, you know, um, the idea of the way I make the art is that the, the title page for this PowerPoint was Aesthetic Arrest. And what that means is, yeah, Hunter is taking us back to, okay, thank you, Hunter, uh, my trusty assistant, because I'm old and I get lost in technology. But um, the idea of aesthetic arrest is that you don't, I don't make art to create desire. Like I don't wanna make a picture of a nice family having a picnic on the beach and you look and you go, oh, isn't that wonderful? I would love to be like that family. You know, that's desire. I don't wanna create desire or paint, you know, flowers or something that people have, you know, sentimental feelings for. Because most people, when they buy a painting, they see a painting of a dog and they go, I have a dog, I like dogs, I'll buy that painting without any consideration of the quality of the art. So I don't wanna make art about desire and I don't wanna make art also about revulsion. I don't wanna make negative art. I don't want people to look at it and go, oh, he's showing us how terrible the world is and how sick everything is and how bad it is, you know, so. I don't want to create that fear or revulsion in the viewer either, because both of them kind of tend to want to move the viewer to either desire or to revulsion or to do something about this terrible uh, ethical problem, you know, like people floating a whale carcass in a tank of formaldehyde. And we're supposed to go, oh, my God, that's terrible. I'll, I'll never eat whale again. So uh, I don't want to do that. So. Uh, I did a lot of reading and I came up on several writers, one of whom was St. Thomas Aquinas of all people, but he wrote uh, uh, some very interesting pieces about art and uh, James Joyce was another one, you know, who did some great writing and Joseph Campbell was another one. And so the idea is to not move the viewer to desire or to fear and loathing, but to hold the viewer at the still point of what is aesthetic arrest, we go. Mm -hmm. And at that moment of aesthetic arrest, hopefully there is a small chance that the viewer can have a glimpse at a higher consciousness, at another way of perceiving uh, themselves and the universe that uh, separates it from the temporal experience of everyday life. And in that sense, I, I feel that the uh, works can have some spiritual quality and, you know, I, I was uh, struck by that notion uh, reading uh, James Joyce and people who talked about, you know, aesthetic arrest, remembering the story of the Buddha where he sat under the Bodhi tree and he, the, the first, the God of war brings his armies down on him and he's not moved. He's not moved by fear. And then the uh, God common brings his three daughters and, to dance for him and he's not moved by desire. He's at the still point, you see. And so I thought, oh, that's it exactly, you know, to be at the still point, to bring the viewer to a realization of that there is something beyond fear and desire. But then interesting enough, you know, turning on the six o'clock news, the whole thing is full of fear and desire. First, the newscaster tells you how terrible the world is. And then the commercial comes on saying, oh, wouldn't you like to buy this lovely Mustang, you know? 
So <laughs> I, I realized that the society in many ways is trapped between fear and desire and that uh, the idea of being able to break through that and go past that and have a little chance to raise one's consciousness and understanding at least of the self uh, was a valuable and worthwhile endeavor. Right. Great. Uh, so uh, you said that you're running a, a art, uh, yeah, art we have class. An art Academy. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, we do several things. We have children's programs where we work with kids and many of them are highly gifted, just amazing and super intelligence. And it's like, I just look at them and go, wow, you know, I hope the world can appreciate them. And then we have a teen program. We work with junior high and high school students where we help them to develop a portfolio for submission to an art or design college. Right. So we've had great success with that. And then we have an adult program. And those are many people who are interested in painting as a hobby, you know, as right. a pastime. But we've had some good, good uh, res you know, results with that because uh, several of our students have actually been accepted to show their paintings at, at the Palm Springs Museum. Great. So, wow. Yeah, so that, that was really gratifying to see that. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's really a great way for us to be connected to the community. And I like teaching because it's a way of socializing my art, you know. Right. Because, uh, you know, you go to a party, you don't really talk about art unless there are a lot of other artists. And even. Right. Then. So, yeah, but to be able to communicate with people and talk about art ideas and things and to see them actually benefit from it and, and enjoy it and have nice results, that's very gratifying. Yeah, so uh, if uh, they want to uh, take a look at the uh, programs and maybe right. uh, possibly join you, then uh, where should they well, see uh, yeah, the website? website? Yeah, it's Desert Art Academy. Dot com. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you say again? DesertArtAcademy.com. Okay, DesertArtAcademy.com. Okay, great. So, uh, wow, it was fun. And uh, it was uh, really good to see you in person and uh, see all this nice work uh, with your commentary on it. That was a uh, uh, so honored experience. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for your kind words and your compliments and we certainly appreciate this opportunity. No problem. Thank you so much.